Okay, it's 7.05, as I can see. And uh, welcome everyone to our next lecture about COVID pandemia. And this is already a fourth lecture in the Dr. Peter Pöldre series. I thought it, it's the third lecture, but Peter corrected me and said it's already a fourth lecture. And as I can see, the number of participants is getting higher and higher. The number is bigger and bigger every time. I thought that that's a topic we are all tired of like listening about. So there are two, maybe, maybe two reasons. The topic is still very hot or we have such a great lecturer tonight. So Peter, you're very welcome to start our lecture tonight and all the participants, I would ask you, please mute your mics uh, until we get to the discussions and then you can turn them on again. So thank you very much for joining us and Peter, please. Uh, Piret, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak yet again. It really is hard to believe that we're now 23 months into this unprecedented pandemic. And when we were last together at the end of September, there was hope that that talk would yeah. be the last and that this talk would not be necessary. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Again, I wanted to thank everybody for participating today. And I do very much look forward to our time later on for questions, answers, and discussion. I'm particularly pleased that a good friend of mine, uh, now retired in Nova Scotia, joined me. And as I said just earlier, uh, his distance from this particular Zoom call has been supplanted today by a guest from New Zealand, where we know that it's just past one o'clock in the afternoon and the temperature is 22 degrees and the sun is shining. So welcome to all of you and I look forward to your participation later on in this presentation. Before I start, I wanted to provide some personal context for those of you who may not know me. I am not a politician. I am not a public health physician. However, as a clinical hematologist, my entire 40 year career was caring for patients who were severely immunocompromised either by their disease or by the treatments that we had to administer. And for 20 years as a vice president at Sunnybrook, I was also very much involved with hospital capacity issues which we will touch upon very soon. I'm just trying to make sure that we can advance there. Today's outline, very quickly, I'm going to look at some of the important Ontario-based outlets uh, uh, out updates since September the 29th when we last were together. I'm going to spend some time, of course, speaking about the Omicron variant revisiting the whole issue of population or herd immunity, speak a bit about COVID therapies and the long COVID syndrome, talk a bit about the healthcare situation under stress, the endemic phase, and we'll conclude with some of my personal thoughts about upcoming individual and group behavior. But as we've done in the past, from the very first uh, talk we gave about this, I wanted to provide some global perspective of what's been happening over the last 23 years. And this is the sad data regarding the deaths per million by countries. And what I've decided to do on the first slide is to look at the G7 countries, the United States, Italy, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Canada, and Japan. And you can see quite a bit of variability from a high in the United States, unfortunately, of 2,718 deaths per million and many of you will recall that just a couple of weeks ago, the Americans surpassed 900,000 deaths from COVID-19 to a low of Japan of 149. And Estonia, because this is after all still uh, a talk mainly geared to Estonians, is actually well-placed should it ever become a G7 or in that case, a G8 country. And you can see that the Estonian deaths per million puts us well below some of the other major G7 countries. Now, right at the outset, 
to dispel any notion that COVID is simply a, my, a worst case of a flu, it's important to realize that both in Canada and the United States, the number of COVID deaths that we've had is tenfold compared to the annual influenza deaths that both countries experienced prior to the pandemic. Now to continue the global perspective for a while, here are the major countries of the world that have fared very poorly during the pandemic. Peru being the worst, many countries in Central uh, Europe being in the three and 4,000 deaths per million, Brazil, 2,917, both Ukraine oh, yeah, and Russia are very that. similar at 2,350 in comparison to Canada at 884. I was also curious to see what the role of isolation or being an island might be. And two of the larger islands in our neck of the woods, Jamaica and Cuba, as you can see, have deaths per million that are not that dissimilar to Canada. But we look at many of the other important islands in the world, we do see a trend towards significantly fewer deaths per million, possibly as a result of isolation and undoubtedly because of cultural and policy issues mandated by the governments of Australia, Iceland, Korea, Thailand, Taiwan, and New Zealand. Now, I do realize that Korea is not an island, but Functionally speaking, because of South Korea's position relative to North Korea, it is at least conceptually isolated and an island. From the Canadian perspective, we see a very similar trend. British Columbia, 520 deaths per million. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, all in the 800s. Quebec, startlingly more significant. But Nova Scotia, again, not quite an island, but pretty close to one being a peninsula, and Prince Edward Island having a lower death per million. Undoubtedly, this has something to do not only with the behaviors within the individual jurisdictions, but also, of course, the geographic isolation that was often imposed as part of public health measures during the pandemic. Now, very briefly, I'm going to look at some of the highlights between September of 2021 and today's date. You may recall that this particular cartoon was done at the time of the third wave going into the fourth wave, and yet here we are already clearly in the fifth wave. So a very prescient cartoon to suggest that this was not simply going to be a three wave phenomenon. And this is a slide that I basically copied from my last presentation. The very same triangular issues are still in play. How well are we being vaccinated? How are we coping with the necessary public health control measures? And how are we dealing with variants that are increasingly transmissible? At that time, we were talking about Delta. We thought that Delta was gonna be the end of the story, but as we've discovered over the last several months, Omicron is far worse. Now in early October, we had some encouraging news from Merck talking about a new pill that might be effective for COVID's worst effects. We will come back to this issue very soon. October the 1st, 2021 marked the 700,000th death in the United States. And I'll want to come back to that particular number a few slides later on. Early in October, we also began to hit that hospitals were facing nursing mega crises. This is a picture of Sunnybrook and uh, a friend of both uh, Bob Lester's and myself, Rue Tagger, featured in this Steve Russell um, picture, basically emphasizing that we were headed for a human resources crisis within all of healthcare over the next short while. But in early October, Everybody was planning on traveling. If you had your shots, you were able to travel. Things looked pretty good, except for people who were going to be hesitant because that was also the period of time when various federal, provincial, and uh, municipal authorities began to insist on vaccines prior to employment. But capacity limits were lifted in theaters and sporting venues. Again, this is early October before our Thanksgiving. 
But on the other side of the world, it's interesting to note that there was a headline about Russians flocking to Serbia for Western made COVID vaccines. And the reason this is important to emphasize is that recent research has shown that most vaccines with the exception of the Pfizer and Moderna appear to be relatively useless against the new variants. And if you think about the fact that vaccines like the Sinopharm, the Sinovac, which represents approximately half of all the global vaccination efforts may not be useful for the new upcoming variants, it continues to create a very large unvaccinated or hypovaccinated pool risking more variants. And this is a theme that I'll return to later on. But it's not unsurprising that people are beginning to realize that some of the homegrown vaccines, including the Sputnik V vaccine from uh, Russia, may not be as effective as we would want them to be. Again, Thanksgiving our time, we had the interesting dilemma of what to do at a social personal level with unvaccinated individuals. Uncle Val isn't vaccinated, that's why he's on the other side of the window. And at the same time, sporting venues, both in Canada and the United States and other places in the world were wide open, despite the hope that everybody could maintain a completely unrealistic two meter distance. Now, it was in November that Pfizer came out with the preliminary announcement of their own COVID-19 pill to be 90% effective at preventing hospitalizations and death. But it took until January the 17th of this year for Health Canada to approve Pfizer's antiviral treatment. Interestingly enough, Pfizer, as the headline to the right shows, will allow other firms to start making this particular pill. I'm going to spend a couple of slides just talking about Plaxovid, which is the Pfizer product. It's a combination of two retrovirals, which in long-term studies has shown about an 85% decrease in hospitalization and death. It's a pill. It can be taken at home by mouth for five days. However, there are some problems with this particular medication. First of all, it has to be taken within five days of the onset of mild or moderate symptoms. And this may not, uh, it sounds easy to say, but it may take a bit of uh, pre-warning for people to realize that they even have COVID to begin with. In addition to that, this medication must be prescribed by a physician and only after a positive PCR test. And as we will talk about later on, PCR testing is not that easily available, at least in Ontario. And it's only allowed currently for high-risk groups 80 year olds and over who are incompletely vaccinated, patients who are immunocompromised, and the indigenous long term care, rural and remote populations. There are also a host of drug interactions. And the cost, although expensive, is certainly not unbearable. But all of the red stars indicate significant practical challenges. And as the headline that I splashed onto this indicates, can Pfizer's pill get to those who need it? And on the next slide, which I will not go through very quickly out in any detail at all, this is the list of the possible drug to drug interactions that a physician has to be aware of before prescribing Paxlovid. And I've put stars beside extremely common medications that virtually everybody over the age of 60 will have at least one, if not more of these medications. So the bottom line that I want to leave you with is that it's an effective medication, but challenges with respect to the practical implications of prescribing it, using it in a timely fashion, and without the concern about absolute contraindications from a whole long page full of drug to drug interactions. Now, on the more serious side, COVID medical management has had a remarkable collaborative effort ever since the COVID pandemic began in early 2020. The Ontario Science Table has reviewed almost 2,400 peer-reviewed publications 
including studies that have involved almost a half a million patients. And these properly designed clinical trials, amongst other things, have discounted absolutely the use of drugs like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, Regeneron, the medicine that was given to the former president, as well as a whole host of other medications. And on the following slide, which I promise I will not deal with in any detail whatsoever, is the therapeutic management of adult patients with COVID-19, ranging from management of the critically ill to the moderately ill to the mildly ill. This particular science table is typically revised every two to three weeks. So if anyone is unfortunate enough to actually have to be treated for COVID-19 in a serious way, there has been an enormous amount of high quality science over the course of the last 23 months that has made that particular treatment as best as it possibly could be. So I emphasize this because we spend a lot of time talking about vaccinations and public health measures, but behind the scenes, if you will, clinicians and researchers have done a remarkable job in terms of trying to define how best to manage these extremely unwell people. Now, another feature in the fall was the need for children to be vaccinated. And as you know, uh, children now between five and 12 are eligible for vaccinations. And currently that number is in excess of 50% that are on the way to becoming fully vaccinated. And yet we have to talk about the COVID-19 variants. So remember from a couple of uh, months ago when we last spoke, we have variants of interest and in the red, variants of concern. And we've all had to learn a little bit more Greek than we probably ever thought we'd need to over the course of the last several months. During the September talk, I brought everybody up to speed on what had happened with the early part of the Greek alphabet, all the way up to mu, which was the August 2021 variant that was only a variant of interest, not a variant of concern, and this was discovered in Colombia. Of course, Delta was the story during this particular period of time. On November the 26th, 2021, South African scientists found the new variant of COVID with a dramatic increase in cases, not necessarily more severe, but dramatically more transmissible. On the same day, the Canadian government announced measures to deal with the new variant, including banning all foreign nationals who travel to any of about six or seven South African countries. And yet three days later, the first cases of the variant were detected in Canada in a pair that uh, came from South Africa to Ottawa. And the World Health Organization on Black Friday declared this new variant and named it Omicron. Now, in August 2021, we had reached mu, and all of a sudden we skipped to Omicron. And so one might wonder what happened to nu and g. Well, the World Health Organization has an answer for that. Nu apparently is too easily confounded with the English word nu, and G was not used because it is a common last name. The, the WHO said, adding that the agency's best practices for naming disease suggest avoiding causing offense to any cultural, social, national, regional, professional, or ethnic group. And I put pictorially one of the more famous G's in the world today. So that's what happened to nu and g and how we skipped in the Greek alphabet to Omicron. November the 30th, another sad milestone in Ontario, the 10,000th death from COVID-19 occurred on November the 30th. And of course, predictions began to fly about this becoming what it ultimately did become a very significant Omicron pandemic. At the same time, there was a lot of enthusiasm for booster doses, Pfizer's being the first off the market. 
and of course, hope that the booster would come quickly enough to prepare us for the Omicron variant's effects. Now, the next couple of slides emphasize the rapidity with which Omicron took hold. On Friday, December the 10th, 10% 10 of Ontario cases were Omicron by analysis. And by Tuesday, December the 21st, only 11 days later, 81% of Ontario's cases were Omicron. Nobody in infectious disease has ever seen any kind of transmissibility to that degree. This was a graph that was put forth from the science table on December the 17th, suggesting in the worst case scenario, we might get to 10,000 cases per day. We soon exceeded that and 10,000 now seems like really hopeful, wishful thinking, we have probably, most estimates would suggest that we were running over the last couple of weeks at anywhere from 30 to 40,000 cases per day. Why we haven't heard those numbers, I'll deal with very soon. This is a graph from Public Health Ontario showing, and I just want you to sort of think about the, the purple line, the percent positivity. By the early and middle part of January, out of 75,000 tests being done per day, over a third of them were Omicron positive. Again, completely unprecedented compared to the positivity spikes that you would have seen earlier during different phases of the pandemic. And so a dramatic report, December the 29th of 10,000 cases, every day during this period of time, every day's count was a new record. At the same time, of course, the province uh, halted social trips and visits to long-term care residents, one of the early reactions that public health officials typically have. And yet because of pressure on healthcare workers getting sick also, there was incredibly uh, interesting concerns about maybe allowing them to actually work while sick because there were so many of them sick. A very counterintuitive suggestion that fortunately didn't take too much hold. By the end of the year, December the 31st, there was a significant shift in the province's strategy. You were now allowed to isolate for only five days if you were vaccinated. There was a presumption that school was gonna start on January the 5th. We know that that didn't happen. But most importantly, PCR testing was scaled back because they simply could not handle the workload. And as a result, on December the 31st, the reporting of 16,713 cases was the last even semi-accurate case count that you're gonna see. Because from that moment onward, PCR testing restrictions came into effect the daily case counts became completely unreliable. They rep represented a significant underestimate of daily cases. And in my view, ideally shouldn't even have been reported by the media, although the media to their credit always had a proviso that this is really not representative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to go back just briefly, 16713 was theoretically the peak you may never see any numbers higher, but that's because we're simply not counting them, not because they're not occurring. So this brings us to the situation in our healthcare system. And I wanted to take a few minutes to very carefully walk all of you through the hospital data that hopefully you're paying attention to. All patients admitted to hospital these days are tested for COVID. And so someone who is a COVID patient has positive PCR tests typically on admission. What I have called and what others are calling COVID incidental patients are patients who are in hospital, they're COVID positive, but the COVID infection is not the reason for their hospitalization what I call the COVID primary patient, 
is the patient who is COVID positive by definition, and their COVID infection is the primary reason for them to be in the hospital. The next three slides are going to illustrate what's happened in the hospital system since December the 22nd until today. And I call it the COVID acceleration, the impact on hospital resources. So you can see on December the 22nd, there were 420 patients admitted in hospital of which all of whom had COVID positivity, 50% of them were on the wards because they had primary COVID problems. In the meantime, at this, on the same day, there were 168 COVID positive patients in intensive care. However, 85% of those people in intensive care were there because of their COVID disease. And so if we just sort of keep that concept in mind, you can see that there was a very steady and very dramatic increase in hospitalized COVID patients between December the 22nd and January the 5th with an associated increase in people in the intensive care unit. By January, you can see that from January the 18th onward, the number, the dramatic number of COVID positive patients hospitalized began to decrease, that's the green arrow. But at the same time, the number of patients with COVID disease causing the be in the intensive care unit began to increase. And at the same time, during all of this period, the black arrow unfortunately represents a daily average of 63 deaths from COVID per day. And although that number has decreased somewhat, today's death count, for example, was still 47. And finally, to bring us up to date, you can see, again, a very optimistic appearing decrease in total hospitalizations for COVID-positive patients, and also a decrease in intensive care patients. However, the numbers at the bottom in red, as of today, there are still 701 patients on the wards in Ontario hospitals that are there primarily because they have COVID. And even more important, there are 291 patients in Ontario intensive cares that are there solely because they have complications of COVID infection. This is not a trivial condition. And it really did stress the hospital system enormously with literally day by day record numbers of admissions. And although there was a lot of talk in the early days about COVID being a mild condition, and it may be for those who were lucky enough to have it in this mild form, the very large number of individuals who had COVID meant that a certain small but very real percentage of those individuals ended up using hospital resources. And to drive that reality home even more and to dispel the notion that COVID was simply some kind of trivial viral infection, Omicron was causing more deaths in the United States than Delta's fall wave. And if you look at the American data, as of October the 1st, and you re, uh, saw this slide earlier, there were 700,000 deaths in the United States from COVID that had occurred over the 19 months of the pandemic. On February the 6th, the Americans reached 900,000 deaths over the 23 months that we're talking about now. But if you think about that, mainly due to Omicron, over only four months, there have been 200,000 deaths. And in the Ontario and the Canadian context, 10% of all COVID deaths since the beginning of the pandemic have occurred in the last two months. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, Omicron is not a trivial condition. Now I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk a bit about long COVID. 
which may end up being one of the very serious long-term complications of this pandemic. The long COVID diagnosis currently is being made, first of all, after three months of a documented COVID infection. It's very important to realize that those infections didn't necessarily have to have very severe COVID infections, symptoms. So the person could have been mildly symptomatic and yet suffer the consequences of long COVID. The long COVID symptoms by current diagnostic criteria must persist at least two months. One of the more common ones, the one that was in the headline that I showed before, is a condition called brain fog, a confusion, an uncertainty, an anxiety. Long COVID is also oftentimes characterized by profound fatigue and insomnia, by pains of various kind, even by the loss of taste and smell, which was one of the early criteria for the alpha variant of COVID, and of course with anxiety and depression. Its incidence is completely unknown yet, but is suspected to occur anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of COVID patients. It can occur in all ages, but it has a very significant predilection for women more than men, about three to one ratio under the current analyses. And there is significantly less risk, although not zero risk, if the patient has been vaccinated. There are, of course, in this early stage, various theories about why long COVID occurs. Many believe that because of the uh, strong uh, women's uh, predilection, it could be an autoimmune condition because women tend to be much more inclined to suffer autoimmune conditions. There are theories that relate to potentially having a variety of very small blood clots in the brain because COVID infection itself uh, predisposes to blood clots. Some believe that it represents a persistent low-grade infection causing inflammation. And others, hearkening back to the chronic fatigue syndrome, think that it may be caused by a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus, which is the causative agent of mononucleosis and was strongly implicated many decades ago in the condition called chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, which I had a fair amount of experience with in my early days trying to rule out any kind of hematologic problems with patients who were profoundly fatigued. So many symptoms very similar to what we see now with long COVID. The therapies are still, of course, very much investigational. The passes of time can help. Vaccination has been shown to be helpful either for unvaccinated individuals or for individuals who may not have had a full dose of vaccination. Antidepressants can be used for various of the psychiatric symptoms and other symptom-related therapy for long COVID. But this may well become one of the very important long-term issues that the medical system and the healthcare system have to deal with after the pandemic becomes endemic. Now, I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time because I'm not a politician, I'm not a sociologist about the divided society, but it's something that will have some impact on some of our later discussions about how we need to behave in the future. And many of you will be aware that with all of various restrictions, there is a group of the population that find these very difficult to manage. We saw instances of people like university students uh, disobeying the, uh, the Western universities rules regarding vaccination. We saw the very sad situation of people having to lose their jobs because they did not wish to have their vaccinations as was required by federal, provincial, and municipal authorities. In Quebec, we saw the interesting phenomenon of first dose appointments skyrocketing after Quebec announced that you'd need a vaccination passport to go to liquor and cannabis stores. So the daily pre-announcement uh, number was 1,500 Quebecers looking for their first vaccinations. The day after this announcement, those numbers persisted up to 6,000. 
So there was clearly some motivation for some uh, mm -hmm. pro provincial uh, individuals in Quebec to seek a vaccine passport so that they could buy their own liquor and their own cannabis. Now, we've oftentimes been also aware of what's happening uh, south of us. And the so-called United States of America is of course right now significantly divided. And at the end of January, the New York Times reported that amongst people who identified as Democrats, only 10% were unvaccinated. On the other hand, those who identified as Republicans, 40% of those were not vaccinated. This may become an issue for traveling to the United States where you want to at least know how that particular destination may have voted. And of course, most recently, we've seen the various issues related to the uh, so-called freedom convoy and all of the perturbations to the economy and to the existence of people living in downtown Ottawa have brought about. I wanted to return very briefly to the notion of herd immunity. And many of you will remember the beginning of the pandemic, there were various numbers tossed around about how high we would have to have a vaccination rate in order to achieve so-called herd immunity. But as I suggested back in September, an absolute percentage may in fact be misleading. It may not be at all a magic number. So whether it's 85% or 90% or 90%, those numbers were only useful as a guideline to encourage as much vaccination as possible. The strict definition of herd immunity is actually a relatively complicated formula that depends upon the transmissibility of the variants of concern, the effectiveness of the vaccines being used, and the percentage of the population being vaccinated. And you'll recall this graphic from my last presentation talking about who was fully vaccinated, people who were on their way to being vaccinated, and in the red, that potential as much as 10% group that never ever, no way will ever get vaccinated for COVID-19. And that brings us to the whole issue of the endemic. And as Teresa Tam said recently, COVID-19 will become endemic. And she in fact directly confirmed that herd immunity is not going to be achievable because of the way in which the COVID virus has shown itself to evolve and create variants. So basically forget any kind of arbitrary number or percentage of people that need to be populated in order to define endemicity, just get vaccinated. Now, when will this happen? Of course, the first assumption it read is assuming no new variant of concern. And if you recall back in the fall, when Delta was our dominant variant, we really had no idea that Omicron was going to be on the horizon. It also has to assume that children, at least the five to 11 year olds are vaccinated because they are a source of infection, not only for teachers, but for everybody who relates to them, parents, grandparents, and so on. And of course, endemicity also still has an expectation of a steady increase in the total population that will be vaccinated. And given the reality of the 10% that I alluded to before, that may never be achievable. The best estimates that I've heard so far, and they're only estimates, hence the number of question marks, may be by the middle of this year but it may not mean a great deal as we'll discuss later. Now, one of the things that we should remember is that we actually have had experience with learning to live with it, but learning to live with it is not the same as going back to normal completely. So what do we have currently that is endemic? First of all, we have the descendants of the Spanish flu. Only 102 years worth of variants, but still, these are direct descendants of the Spanish flu that globally killed, prior to the pandemic, about 650,000 people a year. 
In Canada, that number was 4,000 influenza A deaths per year. And the United States, the number was slightly higher, proportionately 35,000. This is the condition, the flu shot, that ideally is required annually. That has been endemic for the better part of a century. Also, our four common cold coronaviruses, typically with mild symptoms, have also been endemic. So we've had experience with endemic conditions. And ultimately, what I think I'm going to try to impress upon you is that the ultimate concern we're going to have with anything being endemic is hospital capacity. Now, I wanted to remind many of you who may not have sort of looked at it this way, that before 2020, before the pandemic, seasonal influenza had a significant impact on hospitals. Typically in December and January, every year, we had overcrowded emergency departments for regular beds, so-called hallway medicine. Remember that two years ago, but this rarely compromised the ICU situation in hospitals. So we kind of know a little bit about what endemic flu can cause. So the ICU resource, especially over the last while, has been significantly stressed. First of all, remember that we had a fair number of hospital staff that had to be in COVID isolation themselves. At one point, for example, many hospitals are reporting as many as 10% of their staff had to be at home isolated during the month of January because they were COVID isolated, either with COVID directly or had been contacts. The ICU especially has had a significant human resources burnout. Most hospitals have very high job vacancy rates, especially in the ICU, and especially regarding highly qualified ICU nurses. There have been redeployments to try to help the ICU nursing team, but many have retired. And as many of you have heard, politically, there is a significant resentment in the nursing profession toward governments who are very unrealistically, in my opinion, restricting their ability to have raises commensurate with the cost of living. So just remember that the ICU resource is really not just about beds, but it really is the human resource, the nursing and other health professionals that are required to make those beds effective for the patients we serve. Now this graphic I'm hoping tries to capture some of the issue that we need to be uh, aware of for hospital ICU resources. Before the pandemic, we had a stable ICU capacity. And for those of you who may not be aware, ICUs are required not only for obvious trauma victims, but also for people who have undergone significant cardiac cancer and other operations that typically require several days in an intensive care unit to recover from big operations. In addition, people in large hospitals with a variety of complex conditions sometimes need to stay in the ICU because of complications that occur. So for example, somebody with significant diabetes may end up with significant complications that again require time in an intensive care unit. During COVID, as the center graphic shows, we had a very compromised ICU capacity. And this is not necessarily just 25%, but just graphically representing that COVID-19 took a large chunk of the ICU resource across the province. The question remains, during the endemic phase that we're going to be entering, how big will that red piece of the pie actually be? Will it be very similar to the pre-pandemic situation or will it be somewhere between the significant compromise we saw during uh, the COVID pandemic or will it be a more manageable, moderately compromised ICU capacity? So the collateral damage that we're referring to First of all, remember that even patients who are so-called incidental require extra nursing time and extra precautions be taken. And every primary COVID patient, whether they're in the ward or the ICU, is basically not allowing patients with cancer, cardiac conditions, orthopedic patients 
and many other non-urgent patients to be occupying those particular beds on any given day. And those were the big numbers in red that are highlighted earlier that are actually occurring in Ontario as of today. So unfortunately, scientists are warning us that we may need to remember more about the Greek alphabet. And as the slide on the right shows, we have now gotten to the point of using Omicron in the alphabet. And we have a handful of letters left in the Greek alphabet. Now, it's a very interesting observation that the Bible has some reference to the Greek alphabet. And those of you who may have read Revelations 22, 13, know the expression, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And in beautiful alliterative Estonian, you know, all in all ya o, esimene ya vimde, algus ya ots. Unfortunately, COVID couldn't care less about this biblical reference. And so we have to warn ourselves that although we would like to think that the letters from pi to omega will be the end of the variant story, that unfortunately may not necessarily be the case. Mm -hmm. And I draw the picture of the hurricane to remind you that every year, the hurricane naming authorities have to come up with at least 26 different names for hurricanes. We all hope we don't need to do that. But if remember that the Spanish flu influenza A is only in its 102nd year, there is every reason to be worried that we will be dealing with more variants in the future that will surpass the Greek alphabet that ends with omega. These next variants arise from the unvaccinated. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omicron all came from unvaccinated patients. These patients can be here in Canada or they could be in some foreign country far, far away. The UK variant occurred in the United Kingdom. The other variants, we know their origins were South Africa and Brazil yeah, right and now. India. We do not know where the next variants will come from, but with a high degree of certainty, we know that it'll come from somebody who is unvaccinated. And hence, to hope for a happier new year, Peter Singer in this particular article suggested that we really have to concentrate on vaccinating the world in 2022. And there is some optimism in this regard. Just recently, South African scientists reproduced the Moderna COVID vaccine, and Moderna is not contesting patent infringement. In South African hands, their Moderna COVID vaccine is much less expensive to produce. It will likely become the major source of vaccine for most of Africa, and likely will provide similar opportunities, for example, out of India and other countries to do the same. So we do have some optimism in this regard. Now I'm gonna start concluding with the following headline, that when government public health restrictions end and begin to end, we need to think about personal responsibility and risk assessments that will be needed. Most of what I'm gonna be saying is highly personal. It's my view. I'm going to very much welcome your own comments regarding this. And as I say before, it's going to be a personal sense of responsibility and personal risk assessment that I think will define what we individually and collectively have to think about going forward. Let's first talk about boosters. Back in September, we were talking about third doses that were becoming available, but now we're already talking about fourth doses for certain populations 
And as a reminder, when we talk about boosters, in this particular case in Ontario, the third dose, the booster, what we typically uh, talk about is a repeat of the same dose, the same medication. Currently, we have about 50% of eligible population in Ontario has already gotten their third or booster dose. And the fourth dose is currently authorized for long-term care residents, for patients undergoing chemotherapy, and others who are significantly immunocompromised. In the future, we really shouldn't be thinking about booster because booster just means the same vaccine repeated, but rather the next COVID vaccine, tailored to future variants, possibly in the fall of 2022. And what's most interesting is that there's been recent uh, reviews of even some of the more distant vaccine literature suggesting that a single vaccine may in fact prove broader protection against more than simply one kind of virus. Briefly, masks. It's been widely accepted cloth masks are really of no significant use. In inside venues, in my opinion, medical and surgical grade vasks, the blue masks, should be considered when distancing is possible. And the non-fitted so-called K95 mask should be considered when distancing is problematic. And I draw the airplane because I think that's one of the examples that comes to me personally in mind where I would be wearing an N9, a KN95 mask when I'm sitting in an airplane even if all were vaccinated, because we know that being vaccinated does not prevent one from being a potential transmitter of virus. And just as a, ma a reminder, the properly fitted N95 masks are still to be used for healthcare professionals. And as I mentioned in the very first lecture, fitting an N95 mask is uh, a relatively complicated process. It is not simply one of putting a mask on and pushing down the aluminum ties, hoping that they will fit. I'm also hoping in the future that wearing a mask will never be ridiculed or be this, the source of any kind of stigma. People who feel comfortable that they must wear a mask should be entitled to do so without any kind of negative repercussion. Leads us to an important discussion and that is the unvaccinated. We know that currently in Ontario and in Canada, roughly 10% of the population is unvaccinated. Some of these individuals are too young yet to be vaccinated. Some are hesitant. Some are still only partially on the way to being vaccinated. Some have legitimate medical exemptions and many have alternative ideological and philosophical perspectives. All unvaccinated patients are at greater risk of being infectious to others compared to the fully vaccinated. The fully vaccinated can still be a risk, but the unvaccinated are a significantly greater risk of being infectious to others, otherwise known as us. We know that as of March the 1st, only a couple of weeks from now in Ontario, except in long-term care homes, proof of vaccination will not be mandated by the provincial government. So we will have to undertake, every one of us, a personal risk assessment regarding our interactions with the population that we know is going to be 90% vaccinated and 10% unvaccinated. It's interesting to note, and I'll talk about this a little bit later also, that private business may opt to continue requiring proof of vaccination. And I would also suggest that we shouldn't be throwing away the entire system because we may need to hold this in reserve in case we have a future variant that requires some degree of returning to various restrictions such as proof of vaccination, which would allow most businesses to continue at some level as opposed to completely being locked down. Masking mandates are likely going to be the last mandate to be removed. And again, a personal risk assessment regarding interacting with that 90 to 10 concept of the population. It will be for most of us a situational assessment. And again, don't be surprised if the masking mandate 
comes back at some point in the future if there is a significant new variant of concern. And as a reminder, although we always think about the flu vaccine as being seasonal, there's no evidence yet that all future COVID variants will necessarily be seasonal and fall conveniently into the fall season that we have in Canada. Another interesting question, I think, and again, this is almost a sociological question, is how to deal with the unwell, the coughing, and the sneezing. And I'm posing these questions perhaps for all of you to comment on afterwards. Will people who are unwell refrain from work and social outings? Will we be less tolerant in the presence of someone who is unwell? Will managers at a workplace or organizers of meetings be more empowered to deal with the unwell? And will coworkers and attendees be somehow more empowered? We know that in the past, prior to the pandemic, there were many instances where people decided for whatever personal reason to attend work and other events when they were unwell, especially unwell from the coughing and sneezing perspective. So hence the importance of this particular question. What about workplaces and other group gatherings? When no proof of vaccination is going to be required, will we be masking unless there is good ventilation and the opportunity for separation? When we think about workplaces, I think a lot of this discussion is already taking place. Will those who have opportunities have a hybrid, in other words, in-person plus virtual opportunity to work? We know that hybrid situations or even totally virtual situations allow employers to have a much larger human resources pool for hiring employees. And we know that many employees will see any kind of hybrid or fully virtual as a very attractive op option because of travel costs, time, and work-life balance. And especially particular to the workplace, staying home if unwell undoubtedly will be motivated if there is a paid sick leave possibility at that particular workplace. Small group gatherings. So this is particularly relevant to our future at Tartu College, for example. Will we be able to have hybrid in-person plus virtual options? We know from the last two years of experience that our seminars, group meetings, and conferences have had a dramatically wider reach. We don't have to worry about bad weather, distance from the site, the costs of travel to get there, and the costs of parking. And I would suggest that for major conferences, virtual attendees should still be expected to provide some financial support for the technological uh, efforts that are required to host both a, a hybrid in-person and virtual meeting. And again, for small group settings, staying home if unwell is made much more possible if the organizers have a virtual option available. Travel by plane, rail, and bus. No proof of vaccination may be needed. Again, masking issues. And how are we going to deal with someone who may have to travel but is unwell? Will there be separate sections, additional masking or enforcement? And I hearken back to the situation now many decades ago where there were actually separate smoking and non-smoking sections on airplanes and even in restaurants. If you think about that, smoking was only a relative nuisance for us unless we had some kind of lung condition like asthma. Secondhand smoke may have had a very long-term effect, but in comparison, being in the proximity of someone who might be infectious with COVID-19 is a much more serious risk than being in a smoking environment ever was for most people. Foreign travel, Remember that sovereign countries still make up their own rules regarding entry. So no matter what the Canadian government says about entry into Canada, wherever you end up going, that country has every right to make its own rules, no matter how ridiculous they may seem to us in comparison. I think we should be aware of the COVID status at the destination, be aware of COVID affairs, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, foreign affairs, 
uh, Canada advisories because those advisories may actually have a direct impact on travel insurance as we've seen over the last 23 months. If we return to restaurants, there will be no proof of vaccination mandated. We may still have the option of masking. And as I alluded to before, will there be a marking advantage for those restaurants who choose to continue proof of vaccination? And just, uh, just yesterday, a survey done by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business indicated that currently a third of restaurants are reluctant to drop proof of vaccination requirements because they feel that their clientele will be more likely to attend their restaurants if they know that everybody, staff, as well as patrons has been vaccinated. Large crowd venues. Again, no proof of vaccination will be required. Masking will be an issue and we're gonna to have to make a personal risk assessment regarding how we're gonna interact with clientele, with our immediate seatmates around us, above us, below us and beside us, of whom 10% may be unvaccinated. So in conclusion, I've been fully vaccinated, but ultimately we will need to make personal risk assessments and decisions regarding hopefully staying home if we're unwell, wearing a mask as we feel needed, attending events in person or virtually, if that's a possibility, traveling to a particular destination with all factors considered, and most importantly, perhaps keeping up to date with the next generation of vaccines. With that, I very much thank you for your attention and very much look forward to discussion and questions as a result. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter. Could you please stop sharing the screen so we can see more people on our screens here? Uh-huh, there I go. Okay, thank you. Again, very great, clear overview and really. Susan, bravo, bravo. Bravo, bravo, right. Now, if you have questions or comments, uh, you can write them on the chat box, but you can also raise the, your virtual hand and open your mic and ask a question. So choose whatever you prefer. And uh, uh, until you get ready with your questions, I would ask Peter, what are your plans for this year? Are you going to travel to some uh, country like maybe Estonia or some other great places? We, uh, thank you. We have currently plans to travel to Iceland. And the reason for that is that uh, we're gonna be alone in a car and not with a crowd or a group. And we believe that between uh, Iceland being relatively safe and also the manner in which we're gonna be traveling and our ability to avoid crowds at various sites in the early part of May before the peak season, all of those factors uh, came together in our risk assessment regarding traveling. And of course, we all have uh, triple vaccination status. And uh, that's, those are the kinds of factors that came together. We don't expect to be in any crowd whatsoever. Uh, we probably can't afford to eat in restaurants there anyways. So uh, we will see, that's uh, semi-facetious, but I have to say it anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So there is a question. The strain on hospital resources, should they even a vaccinated individual with comorbid Diabetes get the prescription prior to a possible infection to have it ready in case. I, I think the question refers to uh, the Paxlovid. Is that correct? Excuse me. The drug's name was fluvoxamine. Uh, well, I, there's been discussion with regard to the antiviral that's been approved by Pfizer. And people have wondered whether it might make sense given some of the challenges of early diagnosis for people at risk to actually be given a prescription in advance, just in case. Mm 
The problem with that, of course, is one, it's $700, which is a pretty expensive just-in-case medicine. But secondly, the current criteria still require that person to be seen by a physician and to have PCR testing. So basically having a prescription in hand to take just in case uh, is not yet seen to be viable. I hope that helps to answer that question. Okay, any other questions? You can open your mic as well and let, let us hear your voice. BioBlock is a nose spray produced in Estonia to help uh, black COVID germs. Have you heard of it? I'm using it, by the way. <laughs> I, I have heard of it, but again, uh, there is a certain rigor to the kind of studies that are required to actually prove if something works. And to the best of my knowledge, those studies have not yet appeared in the the peer-reviewed press. It's an issue, by the way, that oftentimes is also uh, asked about various immune boosting medications. And there is, of course, uh, always has been, but especially during COVID, there has been an enormous interest, uh, especially in the non-traditional medicine field, of what kind of things can I take to boost my immune system? The challenge with that is twofold. First of all, the studies are very difficult to do properly. And the second thing is that a boosted immune system is not necessarily good for you if you have a predisposition to autoimmune conditions. And so the, the notion that a good, strong immune system is always good isn't unfortunately true because people who have autoimmune conditions, things like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, their main problem is that they have an immune system that is too good. But the bottom line in terms of immune boosting for the sake of trying to ward off infections, very difficult to prove. So Linda Karox is saying, my apologies if this question was already answered. I arrived late. I heard that the person can only contract the Omicron virus once. Is this true? I understand the other COVID viruses can be contracted multiple times. Uh, the simple answer to that question is that it's too early to tell. I mean, we know from various examples uh, that different COVID uh, variants can actually be reinfected. So for example, uh, Prince Charles has his second COVID. We, I have not been made aware of what his variants are, but with respect to Omicron, We've really only known about Omicron since the end of November. So the opportunity to be reinfected with Omicron hasn't really realistically been studied yet. There may be individual case reports out there, but it's not widespread information, but time will tell because we know that there is a huge uh, mass of the population that now do have Omicron infection. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of months to see whether people get reinfected with it or whether by that time, sadly, there may be another variant of concern. So next question comes from Peter Einola. What is your take on rapid testing as an admission ticket to events such as, say, Tartu College lectures? Well, the, the problem with rapid testing, and this was, of course, uh, highlighted uh, in the pre-Christmas period of time where people were desperately lining up at LCBO stores and malls to try to get their rapid test so that they could use it as a, almost like a personal passport to go into an event. Rapid tests are not as accurate as PCR testing, so they will not pick up every infection and they may not pick up every infection in the timeline that is representative of when you really are infectious. They're better than nothing, but at a, at a practical level, unless there was some really important reason to try to do it on a, it, it's not available, it's not gonna be possible on a widespread level. But for an individual or for an individual circumstance, it's been done, it's been considered. A lot of people over the holidays probably used it as a permissive way of deciding that they could get together with 10 or 20 people. 
but it's it's not fail it's not uh, fail safe. Errors can be made with it, and I think that realistically speaking, uh, proof of vaccination, if that doesn't cease to exist. Uh, I think that there are some venues that will still, for the sake of their own clientele or audience, think that proof of vaccination is a reasonable thing. If I was dealing with a group that was known to be uh, older than me, which is the usual way of saying people that are old, is that would be a reasonable marketing strategy, very much like a third of restaurants are contemplating that. And what I've heard from restaurateurs uh, anecdotally is that they're actually going to see over the course of the next month after March the 1st, what their loyal clientele wants. Because if you do the numbers, I'd rather be assured of 90% and not worry about the 10% not coming to my restaurant or business of any kind. But that's gonna be, I think, a very interesting, uh, if I will call it a sociologic experiment to see what happens over time. Hey, Peter Martin is asking, what is the risk to a fully vaccinated individual with uh, comorbidity, comorbidities of hospitalization, admission to intensive care, uh, death with Omicron? What is the top of, of protection against symptomatic infection against Omicron after the third shot? So the, the way in which that's usually answered is that people in the intensive care unit are about seven to tenfold more likely to be unvaccinated. So if you flip that in return, there still is a small percentage of people in our intensive care units and in hospital who are fully vaccinated. And what, what most physicians will tell you is that statistics are useful for large groups, but when you're dealing with an individual person, and hence my emphasis in the last many slides on personal risk assessment, one can't easily quote a number because one of the things that uh, most physicians have dealt with is something that we sometimes uh, semi-euphemistically call the bad luck gene. You can have everything else, you can do everything you can in terms of preventing various illnesses with the medicines you take or the way in which you behave. But if you happen to have bad luck one day, you still may have a problem. So if one has significant comorbidities that can make a respiratory illness like COVID-19, I would, I would be the person that would advocate for being more cautious wearing masks more, avoiding uh, venues that may be dangerous much more. But look at in terms of trying to directly answer the question, roughly 10 times more of a risk for being unvaccinated than being vaccinated to be in an ICU. How do the unvaccinated transmit COVID more easily than the vaccinated? And especially how do they cause new variants? I ask as a completely vaccinated person. So the so it's really just a matter of the opportunity for the virus to to spread to multiply. So if you're unvaccinated, as opposed to if you're if your identical twin is vaccinated and you're unvaccinated and you get the same dose of COVID virus applied to you you as a vaccinated twin are likely to fend off that virus or make its quantity in your nasal cavity and your lungs so small that it can't transmit otherwise. So whereas the unvaccinated person will have a larger amount of the virus replicating in their nose, in their throat, in their lungs. That then leads to the answer to the second question, mutations come from the ability to replicate lots and lots and lots. So mutations really are a function of replication number. So if you're replicating tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, 10,000fold, the chances of one of those replicants becoming a mutant is much higher than if you're only replicating one to two to three. So it's all a function of numbers. It's a numbers game, if you want to put it that way. Syriacine, 
is asking, what do you say to a young man who says he is strong and healthy and he's doing everything for his immune system? He does not think he needs vaccination. Well, so it's a good question. So one way of looking at it is that what do you do from the point of view of yourself? And we know, for example, that on, in Ontario, this is Ontario data, uh, over the course of the last 23 months, only 1% of the COVID deaths have occurred in people under 39 years of age. 125 individuals in Ontario out of the 11,000 deaths were under the age of 39. So if that individual, the, the, the purported individual in the question, wants to know what his chances of dying are, they're very low. So from a selfish point of view, couldn't care less whether he got vaccinated. The real question for a person like that is, what about his mother and father? What about his aunt and uncle? What about his uh, friend who may be immunocompromised without knowing it? What about his grandparents if they have it? What about anybody else he relates to that may be at more at risk? So from a selfish point of view, that person has a very small chance of dying. But from a broader perspective, in terms of the people that he may interrelate with, that's where the danger comes from being unvaccinated. Peter Martin again. Are you aware of the approval of Lupoxamine in Ontario on December 20th last year? as an early outpatient treatment of COVID? Then not particularly, but if it was approved and it, it may be something that was on that very complicated slide that I decided not to go into any detail about. But right now, to the best of my knowledge, the, the only major medicine that is used to try to abort hospitalization is the Paxlovid that we talked about, the Pfizer product. Okay, I can't see any questions from our audience here. You, you keep, keep saying, Peter, that you are not a politician and we know that, but still, my question to you would be, what to do with this 10% 10, 10 of people who are anti this and anti that? Do you see there any way to convince them, changing their minds at some point? Well, as my slide indicated, I think that some of that 10%, first of all, are young. In other words, kids less than the age of five and those 50% that haven't yet been vaccinated between five and 10 years of age. There are legitimate medical exemptions and there are people in that 10% that are still on the way to getting vaccinated. So for example, uh, the, the somewhat famous tennis player Novak Djokovic for the BBC just yesterday said he's not anti-vax, he's just trying to do more research. So he would be considered in the highly public hesitant group, theoretically. So he has claimed that he is not anti-vax. He is just taking his time after 23 months to do more research. So I think that there's a legitimate group within that 10% that are there. From those individuals that are philosophically, ideologically, completely against vaccination, I do not have any answer for that particular group whatsoever. It is simply, a mindset and a belief system that very much like other belief systems cannot be shaken. Uh, as I may have mentioned uh, before, in my experience as a hematologist, I dealt with Jehovah's Witnesses who used two excerpts from the Bible to deny blood transfusions and died as a result of it. So I've had personal experience with individuals who ideologically, philosophically, simply cannot see things the way the rest of us do. And one has to live with that. That's, that's the best the way I can answer. And again, I have some, some personal experience, bitter as it is, with those individuals. Okay, Inno, I think it's an awkward. At what, at what point do people get admitted to hospitals with COVID? <laughs> 
uh, I hate to be simplistic about that, but the answer is when they're sick enough. And it's, I, I'm not trying to be facetious about that. That's still an individual clinical judgment based largely on how a person is perceived to be able to cope at home with the same symptoms as opposed to needing hospital care. And then of course, the extension of that is ICU care. So remember that there are still COVID patients who are primary COVID patients that can be managed in a regular hospital bed. So not everybody who has to go to a hospital has to go immediately to an ICU. So it all depends upon the severity of the condition. An older patient obviously may be uh, more at risk. Somebody who has underlying lung disease, for example, or cardiac disease may be more at risk. So a variety of factors are, are always used. And you can bet, uh, as any physician would know, that the decision to admit somebody to hospital is taking up a very valuable resource. So it's a, it's a decision that is really specific to the individual patient. And likewise, the transition from that patient to the ICU is again, a very difficult step to take because it may not seem like much, but every hospital bed is actually a very valuable resource. And every ICU bed is a very valuable resource. And the physicians that make those decisions as opposed to sending somebody at home with hopefully appropriate supportive measures like visiting nurses to take care of them at home, all of that is, is really a medical decision that's made patient by patient by the doctor that's seeing them. I, I hope that helps to answer a bit. There's no magic number. In other words, you don't have to have an oxygen saturation of X or a blood pressure of Y. It's all very patient specific. Uh, we Continue with ICUs. Myret is asking, because so many of the ICU and hospital beds are full of the unvaccinated, is there a reason to have those patients pay part of their hospitalization costs? They are causing much dis distress and health compromise to others who cannot access the system. Yeah, it's, it's a question that's actually been raised many times. It, there's, a, there's a bit of a philosophical answer to that, but at a practical level, if we took that approach, then the extension of that approach would include everybody who has smoked, not being allowed to have any kind of intensive care, or for that matter, chemotherapy, which can be expensive. Anybody who is not taking their medicines as prescribed by doctors would be in that group. Anybody who at any time in their life went to a fast food restaurant might not be considered. Anybody who was drinking any more than our definition of normal should be considered. In other words, the argument that I'm, that I'm making that most medical professionals make is it's a slippery slope. It's easy to pick on one particular example right now, but if you think about that, why not then use the same criteria for another thing that somebody could control, such as smoking or what they put in their mouth. And so at the bottom line, in, in most countries in the world that have at least a legitimate medical system, that kind of situation couldn't be considered. And you'll notice that, of course, that the premier of Quebec floating the uh, sort of tax of some particular kind realized within probably a couple of days that to implement something like that was not going to be feasible uh, not to mention morally and ethically unpalatable, as, as tempting as it oftentimes might be. We just don't do it for any other condition, and we're unlikely to start with uh, COVID unvaccinated individuals. It is the cost we pay of having universal health care, the cost we pay in living in our kind of democracy. Thanks, Annelise, for mentioning that I missed Alia Pirosok's question here. And the question is, Please, would you clarify a difference in approach to COVID that is dark at this time and its significance from a global perspective? Some Canadian authorities are now speaking of everyone getting Omicron, while in East Asia, which is experiencing Omicron surges, there is still what's been called a zero infection policy in China and Hong Kong. Yeah. the. So I'll, I'll start with the latter point. I mean, we, we simply do not know how truly effective any kind of zero policy would be. 
the 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 civilized country, the democratic civilized country that uh, that tried a zero approach was, of course, New Zealand. And by the way, I'm I'm really delighted if there's anything that shows the value of virtual meetings is the fact that we have a participant now here from New Zealand as well as somebody from Nova Scotia. So for those people who are in the midst of organizing meetings, that's a plug for keeping up the virtual option. But to go back to the question, the, the zero approach has been proven to be virtually impossible unless theoretically you have such an autocratic approach as is being attempted in China right now, that it is unpalatable in a democratic society and probably not going to work in China either. Of course, the Chinese have the ability to not have to report any kind of accurate data for us. So we really don't know other than anecdotally what they've been trying to do. And a lot of that one could argue was, if you will, propaganda prior to the Olympics to try to show that they were able to shut down cities of X numbers of millions of people just to protect the Beijing Olympics from being able to be overrun with COVID. So that, that's the short answer to that particular question. If I may have missed the first part of it in terms of, uh, of the world perspective, the, just to interpret what I think the question might have been, obviously there were people that thought that, hey, let's just let everybody get Omicron and it'll be wonderful. The problem of the two problems with that, first of all, we've now seen both in Canada and the United States and across the world, that Omicron infection is very fatal. It is not trivial. It's not like saying, okay, everybody get Omicron and you're just gonna have a little flu or a little cold, a couple of sniffles, and then you're, then you're safe. It's not the case. The very fact that we had positivity rates of 35% out of 75,000 tests in Ontario a month ago is what landed so many people in the ICU and what has caused over the course of only two months for a thousand people in Ontario to die. We lost 47 people today. We've become immune to the fact that we've got daily averages that are in the 60s and the 40s and the 50s per day. It used to be a big deal before that, but now we've just, the media isn't covering anymore. But the reality is that when you see those ICU numbers decreasing, unfortunately, the most common way for an ICU number to decrease is for that person to die and leave the ICU that way. That's the reality that we're still dealing with. And that's with Omicron. So the notion of sort of letting everybody get Omicron does not make sense from that perspective. The second part is that we know from all the other variants that natural immunity, in other words, immunity caught from having an infection actually does not last very long. And that's why despite having an infection, a proven infection, people are still advised to get vaccinated if they haven't been vaccinated before. So natural immunity is, despite the fact that it sounds like a nice thing to have, isn't really as valuable and useful as vaccine-induced immunity, unfortunately. So I, I hope that's answered both parts of that question. If not, I'll try again. <laughs> it was all clear. Thanks, Peter. Uh, we don't have more questions today. Although some people might think their own questions at home and discussing with their spouses, but uh, really, Peter, we are so very grateful to you again for this clear overview. And if I would add one question that would be about what do you think what the media coverage here in Canada is? How do you see that? Is it like good enough? Could it be better? What should be different to like educate people and really understand what the real situation is? How do you see that? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And I, it's only a personal answer from my point of view. Uh, let me first of all share with you my media sources over the course of the last two years. I, I will confess that I watch both CTV and CBC. I find very useful the podcasts that I listen to twice a day typically from the BBC because the British Broadcasting Corporation has an excellent sort of wider perspective. 
And every once in a while, when I want to get depressed, I'll watch some of the American TV coverage. In the early days, they were very, very good about trying to outline how serious the condition was in the United States. It was not too bad recently. With respect to the Canadian coverage, I think that most of the physicians who have been invited to speak, uh, you know, typically on TV, people like Isaac Bogosh, for example, have done a very good job of explaining in relatively straightforward terms what's going on. If I had one complaint about the TV coverage, and I, I alluded to it before, after January the 1st, we should never even bother putting the number of cases per day because they are so underrepresentative of the true case. And even though the commentator wastes a couple of seconds saying, and by the way, this is underrepresentation, in my view, they would be better off focused on another key couple of data points. I think they've done a good job of trying to emphasize the ICU and the hospital capacity issue, especially over the last couple of months, but they have underestimated the fact that people are still dying. They've underreported the fact that people are still dying. So it's, it's overall, I would say maybe B plus could be better, but again, I, I tend to be a bit more finicky in terms of the information that I would want to see, and, uh, but, but what we do see in mainstream media isn't too bad. Having said that, you will know that there will be people in that 10% group, especially the philosophically, ideologically uh, different people who will say the exact opposite. They will say that all of this is being completely manipulated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they will emphasize different points of data with a different purpose. So for example, the classic one is that it is true that 98% of people or 99% of people with COVID will live. That's wonderful. But at the same time, our emphasis at our healthcare resources are being gobbled up by that 1% who don't. So it's really a matter of whether you want to portray something in an unfairly positive way. And you'll remember that the former president of the United States always made those kinds of comments, ignoring the fact that hundreds of thousands of his fellow Americans were dying at the same time as 99% were living. It all depends on what way, what number you want to believe and how you want the story to be spun. And to finish this evening here, I would take one more question and that's like, um... Alia says, uh, thank you. On a different note, if you have a chance, I'm curious what you as a photographer thought of the COVID Olympic opening ceremony? <laughs> a great, great question. Uh, I was very sad that I couldn't be there, but I, I know very well how difficult actually being a staff photographer at the Olympics is. I've, I've had a chance to speak with people like Steve Russell who covered the Olympics, and it is a brutal existence to be there as a photographer. It is not easy at all between bus rides and, and torn schedules and trying to figure out where to be and hoping that you can get your lenses in the right place. That being said, you know, relatively understated, appropriate, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but I'm not a politician and I'm only an amateur photographer. Fair enough, thank you. <laughs> But you're a great doctor, Peter. Suur, suur aitäh. Võta heaks. Applaus. And uh, can you predict where would there be a fifth lecture? I hope not. I, I honestly, sincerely say that. Uh, I, I really hope not. But I hope that the, 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 the presentation I made, especially about the Greek alphabet, that you all remember that, that as much as we'd like to believe, alpha and omega, it may not necessarily be true, depending upon how future variants are named or unnamed. Mm -hmm. And Levy is asking from New Zealand where uh, this brilliant lecture could be seen again. 
Vemu would post it on our Vemu YouTube channel like in a couple of days so you can share it with your friends or watch it again. Mm -hmm. Lots of information. We probably have to go through this again and again. Suurzuuraita, Peter. Many thanks to our great audience from all over the world. Greetings to New Zealand, Levi. And uh, we'll see you soon on Zoom, probably. Thank you, everybody. Good night.